goal for this first half is to build strong intuitions. I'm not going to try to give you a very formal presentation. First of all, there's not enough time to do this. And second of all, I just don't think for a lot of these things it's necessary. The, the, the intuition will get you very far in topology. And the audience is you. Right? So if you sit here, you should qualify. I'm going to assume you know a little bit of physical filters. I'm going to assume you know a little bit of linear algebra. And I, I assume you can think a little bit geometrically, but that's it. So this, is, this should be fine. Don't, don't worry. Uh, in the afternoon, we have a second part uh, where we can actually talk about specific uh, computational techniques that have already been applied or are in, of interest for, for, uh, for DAPEX. The first is persistent homology, and the second one is using topological filters using in sheets. And these are all big words. And one big part of what I'm trying to do is to make you realize that these are just big words, right? So that they're actually not that complicated, and you can survive just learning these words and it's okay. Um, and um, so we want to learn these two te techniques, and they are going to be specific enough that you will have some confidence that you could implement them if, if you were so inclined. Uh, or at least get close to that implementation. Uh, and the, the, the background is the same, except that I'm going to sort of assume that you've heard the first half. Um, and which uh, hopefully is going to be true. Okay, so with that, let's, let's get going. So what is topology? Um, a very good metaphor is the topology is the geometry of rubber bands. Let's have a rubber band here. And you all know this, like with the rubber band, I can do things like stretching, deforming, the shape is not fixed, it can hang like this, it can be like this, I can twist it, I can do all sorts of fun things with this. Uh, but and in any configuration, you will more or less believe me that this is still just a rubber band. And if I, I can get it back to a sort of loop like shape. Right? So, topology is in a way the study of shape where the fact that we can deform it, stretch it, and so forth is no longer something that we cannot pay particular attention to. We will sort of get rid of these more geometric, and metric here means distance, this distance notion. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some arguments. And I want you to actually have a rubber band. So rule number one, no shooting at other people, no violence. You can just have a fun grab one. And um, if I make an argument and you don't immediately think that it's true that you can sort of deform it, that it's flexible, just try to figure out a configuration with your rubber band and see if you can find the case, oh yeah, actually there is another configuration where this will work, this argument. Um, but so this is sort of a, a, a quick intuition that I do believe actually gets you pretty far. Uh, of course, we're talking about ideal rubber, you can infinitely stretch it, and so forth. Like, this is not what your rubber band is going to be like. But uh, there's a lot of intuition in, in, in this rubber idea that, um, that is good. But there's also other ways to think about topology, uh, for example, in terms of modeling connectivity. And I actually think this is the mode of topology that we're most familiar with, that, that we use constantly. When we model signal flow in a data flow graph, like any uh, DAFX programming language, whether it's PD or Chuck or whatever you have, Faust, they all live an underlying graph that connects our components. And so we're doing topology in some sense in these connectivity models, right? A rubber band is just a thing that's connected the same way no matter how I stretch it, right? It's the study of connectivity. Um, a second notion that's probably less common is the idea of global invariants. And uh, the reason why we say global, right, it doesn't, uh, the, the, for example, you take this rubber band, there's one hole in there, right? That's a number that describes that there's one hole. This doesn't really depend on anything else. We sort of think of that as a global concept. And we'll get more specific about that in the second half, and we'll compute examples of global in their anthropological spaces there. I think this is a pretty rare thing, even though you have seen global invariants in your work. It's just you don't think of them as, as constant or topological. And a final way that gets us close to this rubber band idea is you can think of topology as geometry where we don't consider the metric information. Right? Or where the metric information is something that we can change, like our distances can change, it can be modified. So what is left when we don't consider that? Can be independent of it, or will we have flexibility of choices of distances, right? So you see here that the, the that is what I aptly tried to, to, to do with the rubber bands 
is that right, these are just different configurations of a shape. They still are all loops, right? And so there's something that did not change with this rubber band uh, in this picture. And that leads us to the question um, of how do we say that two topologies are, are the same? And I'm going to be slightly technical here, mostly so we can then just park it. Um, there's a concept called homotopy. And if you have a rubber band, right, homotopy captures how we can uh, navigate a space, the topological, and figure out what it can do. Right? So for example, if I go here, and you think of this surface here as my, my, my space, but I actually put my fist down. But I can do all sorts of things with this rubber band without obstruction. I can move in all sorts of preparation, I can stretch it. But my fist or hand forms an obstruction here. I cannot get out of that, that hand, right? Now, if I had scissors, I could maybe cut myself free. And you may have had situations in real life where you realize, look, all these scissors are going to get me out of this. But these tend to be topological obstructions. And so homotopy describes the space that you can cover with this loop, but it will also capture features where you're stuck, right? And so you see here an example in this picture of a, of a donut surface, right, a torus. And there are few closed loops strong, right? You see this C closed loop. I can actually retract this whole loop to a tiny loop anywhere I want to have it. I can freely move that around. Right? We call this, we can homotope this guy around. And it's just a fancy of saying there's no obstruction to my weird plane with the rubber band. Right? But there's actually two cycles here that have a different feature. Right? If I put the rubber band around the donut like this, I think you can appreciate that the only way I can get free of this band B here is by cutting it out. Right? Because it's, it's stuck around that circumference of that, that donut. And if I have another cycle here that's inside the donut, Again, it's sort of stuck against this inner rim, if you want, of the, you know, the stacking rubber. And there's no way to get rid of this. This sort of these capture essential features of this donut. And if something has uh, the same essential features, we call it a homotopy type. And ultimately, that's a way to describe all the spaces that have the same sort of topological behavior. Okay. Another feature that I think has a very nice um, rubber analogy is this notion of deformation retract, right? Uh, with rubber already, like if you stretch it, there will be a material thinning happening as you stretch it. And that, but that doesn't change the loop behavior of this band at all. It's just this less material here. I could also take a second rubber band and just glue it against the first one like that, and I will just end up with a thicker rubber band, and you would still just say it's a rubber band when it's thinking that there's a different object. Right, so we can add and remove material that does not change our homotopy type. And this gesture of removing material is called a deformation retract. And so here you have an annulus, and let's just shrink the material around the annulus, because you could move a rubber band in the annulus any way you want to shrink all the variation down. We see that the, the, the annulus is actually the same thing as the circle of topology. Okay. So all of this discussion is actually for me to say we'll no longer talk about homotopy. Right? What, what I'm trying to get at is we recognize that when I did this fist example, there's all sorts of possibilities how this loop can lie, but I don't want to go into the, the, the business of describing every single configuration. That's not interesting. So we will sort of get rid of this variation configuration, but it doesn't do anything interesting for us. And so the homotopy is the equivalent, and so we're going to work up to homotopy, meaning we're, uh, all these variations that don't change the homotopy type are the same for us, right? And so I hope you can start developing this intuition what that means, but that just means we're considering only changes in topological features, and the rest is the background. We know we can deform it, we know we can move things around, and the intuition and the formalism for this is homotopy. And it's sort of the background and equivalence. We're doing this all the time in signal processing, right? We understand that our linear time invariant filters are linear time invariant. And you can think of, for example, for linearity, that our filter equations work up to scale. I can multiply with a scalar factor and just our behavior is just scaled. And so I don't need to solve my equation for every single scaling. I just can solve it once 
and it can be scaled and kind of done, and typically just be homotopy into what you want a different uh, shape. Okay, so sorry about that. So, the way I start very technical, and we're going to be less technical from here on out in some sense. So, I already gave an example of gluing that does not change homotopy time, and we put these two rubber bands together. And um, but there are some notions of gluing, and also some notions of cutting, which I already mentioned too, that do change uh, uh, change our topology, right? So rubber bands, the, the, the main part of these rubber bands is to hold like jar lids on things, to hold piles of paper together, and so forth, right? If I cut this guy here, this holding together function dies immediately, right? It's, it's the very fact that this is a loop that can put tension inward that makes this have its function. And cutting will change that property. In fact, cutting will change the topology. Now it is a loop that has a, an inner hole here. If I cut it, it would just be straight, straight. Right? So cutting can change the topology. Uh, and if I had this cut and I glued it back together, I would sort of do the inverse operation. I fixed my my cut string, and so there's sort of two related operations that we have here. Uh, I already mentioned this um, trapped loop here, right? So the way you could actually get this off is by just cutting it, and then you can escape it from the surface of the, of the, of the donut. Um, here's a picture of a, sort of a double torus. And the way we could construct this is we take this towards up here, we cut uh, some disc out of it here, we create a copy, flip it over, and along that open area that we just cut out, we glue these things together. And then we end up with this guy. Right? You see that these two are set different uh, topological spaces, but this is just one hole in there, and one inner cavity. This is hole there and one inner cavity. So these are different, different topological spaces. Uh, and the, the, spin, the way we get from one to the other is through some cutting and gluing operation. Okay, so that, that's very formal, right? And uh, let's try to do some gluing uh, slightly more formally. Uh, and we're actually going to spend a lot of time with objects roughly like this. You, you've seen this in, in many places, but this is just a circle. And I mark the little position here. And how do we get to a circle uh, by just some gluing operation? Right? So here I take just this straight line, right? And I'm gonna decide, I'm gonna actually identify this right side with the left side. And I I now have a straight line where I know if I overshoot here, I have to go back here, and if I undershoot here, I have to go back here. Right? Um, so we have um, uh, identified two points, right? And, and, and this is the length of points we use, but there's an identification of two points. And that has changed the topology. Like this was just an open, uh, an open line. Sorry, I shouldn't say open because actually technically everything is closed, but it's fine. Like this is just a line. And this here now has this topology that in a way we can keep going around this circle, right? And this here is just a different way of depicting this circular object, right? I draw this here as a circle, but by now with the rubber bands you're playing around, look, it doesn't have to look like it's a perfect circle. This is just for us aesthetically pleasing to have some nice object. It doesn't have to be like this at all, right? So this is one example of the many ways you can think about loops. Uh, but you find a lot of topological discussion that leans on these geometric objects just so we can get some familiarity with different things. Because we have this integral zero to one here. And of course we have absolutely no problem if you think of this as a circle, that this zero to one is just the normalized circumference of that circle. Right? So we can carry around these kind of intuitions. Now you can think about like if this was just a completely different rubber band, maybe we can still find some way to go around it and have this circumference of the squeaky line be indexed uh, with a unit interval, right? Okay, so this kind of construction is called a quotient, which I think in this picture it's not quite clear why, why it's called a quotient, 
Some of you have missed out something here because what arithmetic operation gives us this kind of behavior? So I'm losing it here. Um, it's it's the, the, the modular operator. But if you take a mod of something and you overshoot, it will just shoot back down on the other end. So this is precisely what a mod would give us, right? And of course, we understand that a mod is uh, so the residual part of our fraction thing. Right? We take nine divided by three, and that gives us three with zero residual. We take nine divided by two, and we get uh, one residual, right? So that the mod operation is the residual. Okay, so let's have a look at this um, here, right? So let's take a real line. So we have, we have the real line going up here, and I've marked the integers on that real line. And what we're going to do now is we're going to divide out uh, the integers. That makes me say we quotient out, we mod out uh, this object, and it's actually the same thing as mod 1, right? So what happens is we take r and we take mod 1, it will give us that interval, right? Um, but it will give us an interval even as we count up on integers, right? You have uh, an interval here and you have an interval here. In a way, you can think of getting a copy of this interval no matter what the uh, total number was. You'd have 3.9 divided by uh, or mod 1, well, you'll get 0.9. But there's a 3 that got swallowed. Right? For each integer upstairs, we get the same kind of answer here. And that's captured in this picture. And this bottom construction, uh, we write that as R quotient C, right? And the way that mathematicians think of this is really not what we care about, is not what we in arithmetic care about. We usually want to care about, oh, 3.9 divided by 3, and I want to know what, I, what the answer of my division is. Here we want to know only what the answer of our residual is. And so a way to read that is we say R without the C. We take the, the, the integer repetitions out of this case. And that's, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with this. And that's what um, what we get. Okay, so this is actually should be familiar with this from the arithmetic. This is just mod arithmetic for real numbers. Okay. Okay. So another very nice physical uh, intuition about these relationships is the notion of a cover and the notion of holding and unfolding. Right. So if you think of that circle picture that we uh, have here as some wheel, and we think of that as some ground, we can of course roll that wheel on the ground, there's going to be an identification of each position of the wheel to the, to the ground. And, um, and so that's just to say, like, this is a way of saying this is a right? Uh, but by this R mod C construction, it really encourages us to think that we can just keep rolling, right? even though we, we identify this length, as we hit this uh, uh, special point that I both marked on the circle and on that uh, line here, we just keep going. The only thing that happens now is that the print of our wheel repeats. Right? We keep rolling infinitely, but the print that we can get from that wheel repeats. It's a finite print that is actually on that wheel. And so that, that's like a rolling gesture, and you can think of the bottom thing as unrolled. Right? We've unrolled the print of our wheel. You can also invert that idea and think of that as winding. Like you have some sort of uh, wheel and you attach a little piece of string and you keep winding around that guy in some direction. And of course you can do that indefinitely, but you keep winding. And so another length you can use is winding and unwinding. These are all the same things. Uh, the winding language better associated with this idea of a cover. But as you wind the string around the wheel, that string will keep covering and covering and covering that actual wheel. That's actually where this language came from originally in topology. Okay. So we can now take that infinite line and you know we can deform it. We can deform it any way we want. We're just deforming it into this kind of helix-like pattern here. And we're going to identify all these special points that we carried around 
to be in a sort of um, vertical line here. So we have our circle down here, and we have a special form of circle, and we just have this all aligned here. And so you could think of there being a projection from this like higher dimensional thing down and all these sort of align. And in fact, uh, these spiral windings actually cover that circle. Right? So this is just another way to get this covering intuition going now in this picture. Uh, this, this here, these numbers, these are the integers, obviously, they are just what we did with counting. Like, did we wind forward, did we wind backward, how often have we wound, how often did our wheel print repeat? And these numbers actually have a name, and they, the, the name for this thing is called the fundamental group. And it turns out that thing actually already is a, a, a way to characterize the circle. And uh, it's the standard notation we use pi 1 for this. And I know this is sort of symbolic overload. We use pi as a circle constant, and now we use pi for uh, uh, projection and, and the group. And if you, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with, with groups, you don't worry about that. Like, it just turns out that the integers are a group. And so this is, this is a group you can add and subtract and be in the group membership. It's not a complicated thing. It's just a fancy name for something simple. Okay. Um, so again, this is actually, this is just another way to, to draw that picture. And it's just another way to depict things. And we have seen all of this, right? And so you can think of the, the fundamental group as actually being this counting that we've encountered. Uh, but the, the second word that I would like to mention on this slide is that down here on the circle we have still this sort of interval that allows us to go around here. This interval domain is sometimes called fundamental domain, right? And so you can get the full behavior of our circle by having the fundamental domain and by knowing that it can repeat like a fundamental group. So that gives us all you need to know to characterize the topology of a circular life thing. By the way, you know, maybe I should have said initially, if you have any questions, like I'm, I'm very happy and prepared for you guys asking. I don't want people to be confused or if you don't like what I'm saying or you're confused by it, then this probably everybody. Um, okay, so we end up with three what turns out to be essentially equivalent pictures of the circle topology. Right? We have seen this R mod 1 gives us this interval here. That's one way to talk about the circle, and in fact, computationally, that's what you end up doing in your algorithms if you want to force things on the circle topology. Right? But that's actually, you can write it slightly more algebraically as the quotient of R mod C. Uh, but th that gives us the same result, right? Uh, or we can think of it more geometrically as something that's topologically like a circle. And these are just interchangeable notions, and you can use all of them or some of them, uh, however is convenient in your in your specific set setting. Um, so here is how we usually think about the circle. Right? This, the circle is something that lives in Euclidean space. Uh, we often think of it implicitly when we have these circle functions like sine and cosine. And uh, a lot of our work is sort of algorithmic with respect to these sinusoidal functions. Right? We have some time dependent sinusoidal thing going on, something that might be a frequency. Uh, and and uh, we have discovered that you know, complex exponentials are very awesome because they basically give us circles. Uh, but they also give us a very nice, clean way to compute things on the circle. And we can just project out one direction and we still get our sinusoids back. Um, so that's, that's how we think about, uh, about uh, circles classically. And um, I want to recast that a little bit more topologically. Right? So this picture could be just uh, what I just said. This could be. Uh, this time index sinusoidal function. Right? The way this is actually rendered is as an iteration. So I have a position on the circle, and I'm just going to go to a next position in the circle with some step. Right? Now, the nice thing about the, that recasting is now I'm just saying a position on a circle to a position on a circle to a position on a circle. I've actually removed this 
implied reliance on of the underlying space that is actually going on with the complex numbers. The complex numbers lives in this Euclidean space with a lot of rigidity. You can't actually form this at all. And so we're going to move on to this topological space and do dynamics on that topological space. And um, and I've sort of hidden this in this example, but if I actually pick a different, if it allows me to do this. Uh -huh. Oh, here we go. So the, the, the green lines connect the, the actual successive positions on the circle in our iteration. Right? This is just the one step iteration we're computing here. Okay, so how does this actually look more specifically? Right, so we're going to think, so in a lot of we want time series, we want samples. Like all these samples is what we're all about. Uh, but we're going to have this iterative process now. We have a previous position on the circle, and we're going to compute the future position on the circle. And we're going to have some function that computes that, that change in position. Right? This part here we now know. Right? We're just going to set the same on one, and that gives us the parameterization between 0 and 1 that is this circle. Um, and this whole thing, we're going to call it iterative phase function, like phase in analogy to how we think of phase on the circle. And of course, we, we usually have some projection, but right? this could be a sinusoid or, or something else. Uh, it turns out you can, uh, oh yeah, here's just a, sort of a, a quick cartoon of what that function looks like. Right? So we just have an iteration step by step, and all we need to remember is the previous position to compute the next one and the knowledge of some function, right? And this function is a function from some position on the circle to another position of the circle. So there's like three equivalent notions of notating this thing, and these kind of maps we get from the circle to the circle are called circle maps, right? So this is, uh, this is what that is, and in the dynamic systems literature, this should be read as topological. Like they don't actually mean a rigid circle. They mean uh, that we, we have an indexing on a circle like this, and we can get from one position to the next. Okay. So the nice thing about this formulation is that um, it's just local. But I have one point, I have another point, and we compute computation between those two. So it's, it's very easy to do nonlinear things here. So this is, you can already see, this is an actual nonlinear distorted oscillator right here. And I can play with that distortion and do some different one. I don't know why that is not nice to me right now. Anyway, this is not supposed to be like this. But it's I just keep clicking. Okay. Anyway, you, you can see what's going on here. Uh, this is just one function from one point to the next point, but not, it's now no longer linear for each position. Like each position can get you a different distance, and so we get these kind of distorted oscillators from this. Uh, but one point here that's very nice is like even though I, I can do I, I, we can do much more harsh nonlinear things than this in this formulation, but we guarantee that everything is on the circle. So this is actually stable, I and mean, we can do crazy nonlinear things. But by having it confined in a circle, it will never blow up on us. Right? So I, I like to call this idea topological stability. Like by having picked the right topology of our domain, uh, we get these unconditionally stable algorithms. And so like uh, for my other best algorithms, tell it like by just throwing that one one and you are fine. You're forcing the circle topology and that nothing's gonna have a blah blah. If that's what you want, it's a different thing. It's consistent with the ideas you're trying to explore but uh, it, it guarantees stability. Um, there was another idea I wanted to tell you about. Anyway, I'll, I'll fill it in as it comes to me. <laughs> okay. Um, oh yeah, so um, if, the, if the nonlinear gets very high, these can be chaotic and so forth. So this is a very good way to do uh, these chaotic oscillators. Um, some of you may have worked with chaotic oscillators, like a very popular one is the logistic map. But the logistic map, you need to specify the range of operation because for some parameters it's unstable and goes to infinity. This is something that will never happen, right? So this is just a very nice object to deal with. And it turns out like uh, the, the sort of the terminology of 
um, also there are techniques that we've developed over the years. They can all be recast in this language of, of iterative phases. And I'm just going to point to a simple one right here, sine of lambda. Well, what happens? We have a previous position on our circle, and we have a constant. So if we step on the circle with constant interval, we just create a sine of lambda. Uh, but we can have a, a whole other range of oscillators, like for example, where's fm? Here's fm. Uh, we have our base oscillator here, it's constant stepping around, but we're going to perturb it with a modulator here that has its own constant phase. Right? So this is another constant oscillator that perturbs this guy. Right? So this is not very complicated to read. Uh, it's just by having it written this way, this is now an iterative process. Right? And I only have to compute it locally, and, and it, it can be interpreted. The second thing that's nice and comes out of this is you really see that the projection is completely independent of our stepping around the circle. Right, so there's nothing inherent in picking uh, a sign projection for our frequency modulation. You could just add in something that looks more like ratio shaping right away, because not, this is not an essential way of projecting out these kind of oscillators. Okay, and you know, they can be chaotic. A lot of these examples here are, um, and it doesn't cause any any issues. For us. Okay, so. A any questions so far? Everybody happy? Yes? Maybe it's me. It's probably me, but I fail to see how this is different from phase modulation. No, in fact, I think I have phase modulation on, on the slide. Uh, where is it? No, well, phase modulation, frequency modulation, like they're, they're brothers, so it's in a way in there. Uh, in some sense, it's not. Right, so uh, there's a very great tutorial by Bill Schottstedt that's called, I think, Introduction to FM, who actually gives the iterative form of FM in his exposition. So this is known. What's in a way what I'm sort of instilling is that this is a topological way of thinking about it, that you can actually play with, because, uh, like, in a way, we encode that we're on the circle by this final projection, right? And it doesn't have to be. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, so some of these are straight out of literature, some of this I think just some slight rewriting to make it work. So this thing per se is not that new or interesting, it's just sort of the, the way that it allows us to rethink that conception, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Because I'm sure there's other people who have the same question, so don't be, don't be shy, I don't think it's just you. It's not just you. <laughs> I had the same question when I started working on this stuff, so it's, it's, it's good, it's a good question. Come on. Uh, okay, folded circles, okay. So here, so the way, quick apology in, in, in a way, right? So uh, there is a, a body of algebraic topology that mathematicians about. And what happened uh, about 80 years ago, the mathematicians decided mathematicians is for mathematicians. So they create formulas that's convenient for their work, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with this. But I think it also needs a math mathematics that's convenient for us. And they should be close, but we want things to be accurate. We want mathematicians to prove that what we're doing is right. But we also want them to be fitting for our setting. So this construction here is actually the, uh, something that's not something you will likely find in a, in a math book on topology. But I think it's very important, and we're going to see some more examples of this. I call this the folded circle. OK. So right, if you have a circle, and you just squash it down onto a line, you end up with like two folds on both sides. Right? There's a fold where I hold here, there's a fold where I hold here, right? In a way, the way we talked about this in terms of uh, circles so far, it's really more like this picture. I think one exceptional point, and everything else, we don't really know what it does, right? So by, by insisting on this second fold, we add more information. This is an extra constraint we put on our circle construction. Um, but it just turned out we, we run into these kind of configurations a lot in, in audience and processing knowledge in a, in a little bit. Uh, so, right, so you can see my cartoon here. And the top, I gave more of a circle view, but I've actually now marked two exceptional positions. And I'm also adding arrowheads on the top and the bottom. Because in a way, uh, when you have these two folding points, you can sort of, you see there are two strands connecting these folding points, right? And so, whereas, you know, here, if I just hold this one, you know, which way do you going around, which side, it's a different differentiation. 
it's not clear. So this is just symbolic marking. If you wanted to color these or do something else, that's all fine. I just want to show you what happens with these markings as we go through these different configurations that we already talked about. Right? So we, we now know this sort of infinite line that we repeat, this unrolling of our circle. But right? we can take the circle up here and roll it on that line. And if you observe how these arrowheads print on that circle, you will see that actually these arrowheads start alternating like this. Right? So there is something happening with the configuration in these different depictions. You can also do something like a covering space again, something like a, now a, a linear version of this helix that we had. And you again see that in this picture, because we keep pulling back in and out, in and out, uh, we get an alignment of these arrowheads in this picture. And you, you kind of get, you see a motivation here also for the photo, like this is more of a sort of a harmonica Ballos type thing where paper folds back and forth uh, like that. And this is just, again, this is just a redrawing of this line just in a different configuration. Okay. So, why, where do we get these kind of folded circles? Well, we get them um, a lot for, because, in a way, the, the, the sign projection ready is actually an example of a folded circle. We should just go back. If you look at this picture and you drew it sideways, well, this looks like a sawtooth waveform, right? It has a minimum and a maximum, and it goes through it. If you allow yourself to deform it, you could think of deforming this into a sine oscillator, whatever it is. Something that has one minimum and one maximum will look like this, right? And so the projection onto something like a, a line often gives us a minimum and a maximum, which is a simple oscillator. And so in, in those kind of situations, we get the folded circle, but we also get them in other situations, and I'll go through that, those examples too. Uh, so Fourier analysis, you know, some of you should a side read of relief, you know, with all these weird things, supposed to be blah, 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 and falling asleep. Fourier ana analysis usually gets us excited, right? This is our bread and butter work. We like, it's so close to how we hear things. This is, this is exciting. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures in the DSP textbook. This is out of Ken Stiglitz's DSP primer. Um, he calls it the sixth domain of signal processing. And uh, at the top, you have analog signals and analog filtering, and middle you have digital filters, and at the bottom, you have your sort of uh, uh, short term window signal processing, with finite length coefficient filters and so on. Okay, and uh, of course we understand that there's a duality under our Fourier transforms. You can, it's invertible with an inverse transform. Uh, but what, what Ken does here very nicely, he, he gives us this behavior of the relationship of sampling and aliasing. Right? So the way we, we see about some people think about it, like a signal comes first. You think on the left side of this diagram first. Right, so in analog filters have these continuous signals, sampling gives us a discrete uh, signal, and, uh, and let's just stay there. But what happens is because we sample, we've dropped information, right? And so because we've dropped information, we have introduced ambiguity here that uh, can give us problems. And these problems, for us, this is a problem called aliasing, right? So because, um, a higher frequency signal may actually hit that same point here now because there's no constraints in between that can disambiguate them, right? And as a topologist, we actually would want to look, wanna, uh, want to look on this right side because actually this arrow here we should not have seen, right? We have done this construction of an infinite line where we quotient out z and we get a circle, right? So this gives us a topological interpretation of aliasing. Aliasing is the quotient uh, construction. Okay, and that gives us also a topological reading on what aliasing means. Right? The, what happens on the circle is, I use that as an infinite line, right? 
but actually we get the repetition of each of us on that infinite line down here. So we have inter integer multiples for each point of the circle. How you can reach it? You did you reach it by going on one and a half times, one time, two times, three times, right? Integer many times, and all that ambiguity is what is introduced by having having created this portion. Right. Now, this is now a topological argument, right? It doesn't actually depend on this circle being a uh, Euclidean circle. Like in Kant's derivation, this here is an actual honest to good transformation from the real line onto the complex numbers. Right? This is an actual rigid phaser. But now we can actually make the same argument not relying on this rigidity. And this now works for other geometries too. And you all sort of know this, right? You have a racetrack. Racetracks are not circles, but they are some other shapes, Formula One racetracks, right? You put the sensor somewhere that tries to pick up cars. And depending on the sampling rate of that sensor, you may be able to evaluate if that car did one lap or two laps or how many laps it did. And it does not depend on the shape of that track, right? So you can get aliasing by sensor pickup on any shaped loop, right? And we get, we now know that that's just true. Like the quotient construction is what creates aliasing, and, and the, the magnet K is just a special case of this. Okay, right? But the same thing goes, happens here, right? So why do we get this circle down here uh, from this dash line? Well, we, we create a short term um, signal processing. Uh, solution down here, what well, we assume periodicity, right? Again, we periodically repeat that domain over and over and over, and we fold that over that circle, find it over the circle over and over again, and we get this picture, right? So in a way, topologically, it's easier to make the aliasing argument than the sampling argument, whereas the way we're trained, we're, we, we would like to first make the sampling argument, and that that is uh, is, is nice for us. A any question about this? Okay, I'm actually going to have more, so maybe, maybe we can get used to this kind of insanity. Uh, so some of you may, have, may know the idea of folding diagrams, but this is a way to depict uh, aliasing for, for single processing people. Uh, and this picture I've already showed you, this is just the, uh, the, the cover of the folded circle. And I can just fill in numbers, and it gives me uh, an example of a folding diagram. Right. In, in fact, sometimes the nightmare frequency is called a folding frequency in the literature. Uh, by already having picked up on some sort of uh, metaphor for what happens when you overshoot your frequencies and you get into AC. Right? We know that but if you go up and up and up towards Nyquist, and that overshoot, the way uh, the alien manifests, it's actually going to creep downwards back into a domain from the top. So we're going to get this alien artifacts on the top end. Right? This is because this is a folded circle, right? If this was a normal circle, it would fold down at the bottom because it goes all the way around, and only as it comes to the uh, one distinguished point, it will repeat on the circle domain, right? So we know by the releasing pattern that what we're dealing with here topologically is this folded circle, which is a special case of, a, of this other circle, which some people just call it the flat circle because we use this flat line method. Okay, so the, the take home here is that this nature of how it folds in, uh, A is folds in is a topological phenomenon. And again, you should expect this under deformation, right? So um, you have some sort of way to deform your frequency domain. This should still A is in this way, given that that's the connectivity of our problem. Okay. Um, The, these ideas also work on a different example, and I like this example is because I, I sort of made the case that projection gets us these folded circles. This is another way where we get folded circles where we can actually project it all. Right? So uh, I call this the six domains of wave equation sort of like an homage to, to Kent's picture. But what I've done here is on the left, we're supposed to think various forms of wave equation modeling. Um, and the top of the infinite string, so this is just a string that goes to infinity in both directions. And we know that the Fourier transform of that infinite string gives us an infinite spectrum. 
So that's just a standard wave equation type uh, spectral modeling. Now, as we introduce boundaries, we actually aim this. Our domain is now finite, and energy can only travel on this finite thing. Also, like we know that this is the ideal wave equation. We just have traveling waves. You can think of waves traveling on this finite domain. And the boundary has sort of forced us back inside and repeating on that domain. So the introduction of the boundary is actually the same thing here as uh, as aliasing, which is the same thing here as creating a quotient of our infinite string onto the finite string. Okay. And again, like we know that the finite string, the boundary string, has a discrete spectrum. Right? So this is just what we see here. This is uh, a known property of, of that spectrum. And so what happens when we do a waveguide model? Right? We're uh, sampling our traveling waves, right? So we get this sampled version of this circle topology down here, and that gives us an alias discrete spectrum. Okay. Uh, so another thing that I personally like about this is like we like to use circular buffers to model our uh, digital filters. Right. For the waveguide, here's an argument why this is a really good mix. Right? Literally, the circle topology of our circular buffers is, precise, is a precise match to our topological construction. Right? So it should not be surprising these are good uh, models for our algorithms because they literally have the exact right topology um, of that filter. Okay? Any, any questions about this? Right, so you, you see that the game we're playing here, right? We're, we're learning how to read things that we already know in these sort of more topological ways. Um, okay. okay, so, you know, I like, I like waveguides, I like to do, I like to play with them, they're one of my favorite things. So let's do a little bit of playing with waveguides. Uh, up here on the left, yeah, at the middle position, I just started an impulse. And the correct solution would be the sum of these two strands. So this is just a wave that in one variable with an impulse shot into it. And they do their thing, they travel with constant speed left and right, and they bounce at the ends. Right? So this is very close to how we usually think of a wave guide. Right? And just for, for fun, what we've done here is we've like we've glued together these bouncing points and we've sort of lifted this flat construction here into a two-dimensional space and made it circular, right? Uh, and just visually, what you're already seeing is that something funny happens, right? If you follow the green arrow, he's not always traveling forward, right? So this motion that we've done here is sort of lifting into a higher space and sort of unfolding this hard flow that we have here into something smaller. <coughs> Is that's done a lot in, in <coughs> dynamic systems and singularity theory, and it's done precisely because it turns something like this is a discontinuity, a jump in how our direction functions, in something that's now moving forward. Like you do no longer have to account for direction; it just always keeps going forward on that space now. So that's just a little nice thing that happens by us turning this uh, into a more topological space. Right? So now we have a circular depiction. On it. Uh, in any case, these two pictures still very much are just waveguide models. Right? They go at constant speed, these are undamped impulses they keep ringing, and, and this is an actual, like, under sufficient restrictions, uh, an exact model of the wave that we do here. Uh, how can we make this more topological? Right? So observe that when the blue arrow is going in the upper branch, it's always pointing down. And uh, if the green arrow is going the other branch, it's always pointing up. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the specificity of how it moves, and we're going to replace it with a state. We're going to say, okay, what state is that arrow in? And we're going to encode that graphically here. Right. So let's assume that uh, this back branch here is the top side, and the upper branch here is associated with the green. You can see the green points up, so we are up here. And when we're up there, the group went down, so we're down here. So we have we've now encoded this up-down state into, uh, into these loops here. And you can check if I did this right, uh, and I did C 
So, but we should still check because I'm, I may be wrong. Uh, and so now we have this cover picture, and we saw in the universal cover. This is not this infinite spiral is a finite spiral, uh, but it gives us some information about this, and we can just get back to the domain that we usually work on by projecting this down uh, and then projecting again to get us onto the line domain. Right? So this is sort of we've lifted the problem topologically and just kept around some of the information. Now, the nice thing about this picture here is this no longer assumes that these impulses travel at that sort of uniform speed. They could wiggle a little bit, they could uh, slow down, you know, as long as there's nothing happening that changes our loop topology, there's no scattering, this actually works. Right? Here we didn't actually do any damping. Like this actually is robust against damping. Right? You could damp, and we know that damping does not change the sign of our amplitude. So this actually covers damping impulses too, right? So this here actually does not say uh, assume impulse shapes. These impulses could spread as long as they follow this pattern we're still doing. But so we're, 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 we're removing information, but keeping just enough information around that we capture this dynamics in a much more general way. And suddenly the argument holds for many cases, even when we have a hard time finding a precise solution. And that's, by the way, part of the motivation why topology was invented. Poincaré was trying to solve two and three body problems. And he was like, this, like, I'm an expert in integration. I can't integrate this stuff. But can you still say something about this? The answer is yes. We can say a whole lot of it if we go into topology. Because you know, as long as you can show me that that's a topology, I know behavior. I know it's going to bounce. And to give you a, a more example, because let's do this with different boundary conditions. Okay, so this is the case we just did. We had the clamp string on both ends, and this double cover uh, looked like that. Like the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, my French pronunciation is horrible. It's a German with a French name. What the German is. Okay, here's a German with a German name, Norman. Uh, this is open boundary conditions, but you have a, a flute. Uh, and there's no, there's no sign reflections at these boundaries. So they just stay in their state. If it points down, if it points down, if it points up, if it points up, and it just keeps going. Okay, and we have mixed boundary conditions. Right? This is like an uh, organ pipe that's, that's, uh, that's uh, covered on one end. This is uh, reed instruments, clarinets, where uh, as first approximation they act like closed ends, and so forth. And you see something very interesting here, right? We go, we go, we go, we go. Oh, we cross it, we go again, and then we finish the loop. We have to go around twice. This is known as the cover of the movies. Okay, so you can actually do this at home. I, I decided not to do the construction with you. you. You glue together a piece of paper, you twist it once and you glue it, and then you try to think around the rim, like the, the boundary of that strip. And the pattern that you're going to trace out is exactly this picture. So the, 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 the double cover describes the boundary action of a Mobius. Okay? So what we've just discovered, oh, what's going on here? Like the clarinet, the, the cap organ, those, their dynamics is like a, a, a Mobius. And there's some properties that we actually know uh, from, uh, from direct uh, computation. Right? We see, in these two pictures, we have to go around once, right? or we have to cross the domain twice to close our loops. Right? Here we have to go around two times to, uh, to uh, complete the loop, and we have to cross the domain four times. Right? The domain is just back and forth between the two boundaries. Okay, so we know this. We know that the wavelength of a capped organ is half of that of an uncapped one. Right? So the way you do this really low frequency organ types is to cap it, because it gets you an octave lower. Okay, so this is like, we now make this argument completely topological. It doesn't matter if there's a horn in there, it doesn't matter if there's thinning or thickening. As long as there is no scattering, this is the right thing, right? And we know that this frequency halving is going to happen even in weird nonlinear cases that we have hard time computing. Okay. Uh, come on. <clears throat> okay. All right. So let's get two dimensional. Any questions so far? Everybody happy? Okay. Good. 
can check my time and how we're looking. Okay, we have about 20 minutes left and you guys are free to relax. Okay, uh, okay so the chorus. Uh, how many people actually have played Catman in here? We're going to play Catman. Yes, excellent. All right, so I encourage you to skip all these slides because you know what I think about that. So Pagman is this, uh, this, I have no idea why he's a man, by the way, he's a green circle, uh, who eats things. So, but uh, the, the way that the game plays is Pagman kind of leaves with this thing and comes with, uh, for the next year, and I can only be split into pieces to do this, right? But of course, we understand that you can just continue to move around this playing field even with this weird connection, right? And um, we can do this identification of these two edges and form a cylinder. And so I'm very grateful to Archie uh, Gary is lovely to use his very cool animations here. And so when we do this, again, rather than have a discontinuity in our construction, we now, it goes through this uh, seam seamlessly. And so this kind of play field is really well described as a kind of a cylinder. Run around the cylinder, and in the cylindric world, it's all continuous. Right? This is the same thing as we did with this straight line we identified. If you keep it as a straight picture, there's a jump there, but really it's a circular topology, and this is really just a circle. Right? This is uh, many sections of circles that we have identified here. Okay, this is a more interesting playing field we can, you can cross in both directions, and now we have to identify both these edges. And you're doing this in one big swoop. You could just do the cylinder first and then glue it together like this. We're going to see this later again. And uh, now, Pac-Man is seamless in all directions, right? So we now literally see this torus as a world. Now, Pac-Man's Pac Pac metric is flat. Pac-Man, the world looks like a flat world. Here, for our entertainment, we have worked this metric. Like, this is not the right metric here, but it's the right topology. Right? And it helps us see that there's no problem with the continuity. That this, is, this, this thing indeed should be thought of as a torus. And mathematicians would call this a flat torus. And in fact, this is the only example in the math literature where I've seen that mathematical matches. So this is not my idea, this is literally hard for math. Okay, here we go. So the final picture is this um, infinite plane now. You used up this infinite line, and now we have two minutes to do this infinite plane. And very correctly, you see copies of Pac-Man in each domain. Right? Because we already seen the interval is the same in each copy of our infinite extension. So everything has to be the same. There cannot be any different information in these different domains. So of course, Pac-Man has to, has to live in all of these worlds at once. He doesn't know about this because luckily there's always obstructions so he can never see himself. So this is not uh, some sort of nine bad exercise for Pac-Man. Okay, so this is just a version of what that we have already seen. When we had uh, three different ways of talking about uh, these flat metric topological constructions. Well, this flat is not one arithmetic if you compute them, but now I'm just going to steal the Cartesian product to indicate this two dimensionality here, and we have another one, right? So we have a rectangle here that describes our shape. This now is the fundamental domain of the torus. So a, a rectangle like this, that's the fundamental domain of the torus. Right? We have this infinite tiling of the, uh, of the universal cover of the torus here. And again, these are all just big words for very simple things. And so we don't have to be scared of the universal cover, it just means this. Right? And again, you can think of them as being rolled up into these circles, and we are the product of two circles. Okay, so I actually want to do this for you guys, to my favorite little origami thing. Yes? Sorry, quick question. Why are we thinking of it in terms of a torus and not as a sphere? So, um... Sorry, I'm not sure if everyone heard. Um, why, why are we thinking of it in terms of a torus instead of a sphere? Yes. Um, what's a quick way to explain this? Like, it turns out that uh, the sphere does not work. Um, <laughs> how do I... So, 
So maybe I can defer this to the afternoon because we're actually going to cover the difference between a sphere and a torus there. And the other thing, again, give me some time to find a good answer. Because what I'm going to do in the afternoon is actually not a direct answer to what you're asking, but I, I want, to, want to give you one. Um, it's actually related, yes, go ahead. Sorry, so to make a torus out of a square. Yeah. So, um, so maybe we're going to get our answer right here, yeah. I'm going to try to make a torus here. So, um, yeah, to, to get a torus out of a square, you have to stretch some surfaces, right? You have to deform yes. them. Um, well, actually, no. I was just about to show you how to do it without stretching. <laughs> okay, so maybe that's the answer then. I mean, well, you cannot make a sphere out of a square without stretching it. Yes. Right. So, part of what's happening is that we are very good at thinking geometrically. Right? So that's where the stretching is important comes from. Uh, we, we have a picture of the sphere and so forth. Um, to really explain what you are saying in a technically sensible way, we have to talk about how does this, an object sit in space? Right? How do I put the sphere into space? We'll talk about these kind of notions a little later. So I'm going to defer some of this. But I still have a, uh, let me just do this torus construction so we can get to some of this. Okay. So, I'm going to do an origami torus. Right? So here I have just a rectangle. This is, you can think of this as the, the fundamental domain of our torus. Right? Uh, when I fold once like this, I can also just fold it like this. Like I form the cylinder. Right? But I'm actually going to do the fold. I'm going to fold it like this. Okay. So, and here's the first kind of relating to what you're saying. I call this a cylinder. Like, of course, I assume that this spot in X is not good. Some people don't call this a cylinder because they are very offended that it doesn't have this embedding into three-dimensional space that we want for our cylinder. And this, this different frames of reference is what makes some of the thinking about the point tricky, right? Because topologically, this is a cylinder. Like, there's the interior here, right? But I just flatten it out completely. There's right? so this notion of some space in there. I sort of abstract it, but I don't care, right? Uh, for our for our work in signal processing, it's very helpful to allow ourselves to think of these things as cylinders. Very important. <coughs> okay, now given that you have agreed that this is a cylinder, if I fold again, okay. Now this is the simplest origami thing I've ever done. I love it. This is my favorite origami thing. This is a torus, <laughs> and I'm not joking. I'm going to explain it, right? So this was a cylinder, meaning this edge is glued together now. And I'm now folding this over, and if I glue the inner edge and the outer edge here, then there's an interior. Everything that's white is now glued inside. There is a torus hole right here, right? This is literally, if you take a, 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 a torus like wheel and flatten it with a flatten, it is this. With the right of geometry, but this is actually with all the gluing that I said, this is a torus. It just does not sit well in a geometric space. Like our curvature here is completely messed up. Differential geometers are going crazy. What kind of general space is this? <laughs> and, no, this is a simple space. And we in the process should think in these simple spaces. Like this is almost embarrassing single torus. Right? But it is the right torus for our construction. Now, to your question, you can try to play with the red angle. In fact, I'm going to give you one. Try to con construct a sphere. <laughs> Let's see how we get there. So. <laughs> okay. So with deforming, he can actually construct a sphere, except the, the, what's different is how he identifies things is going to be different. It turns out they are not homotopy type equivalent. Okay? Um, and you could have a Pac-Man game on the sphere. It's just a different game. Okay. So these are all very good questions. Like, to start thinking about this topological construction, it's mind bending. And, uh, and, um, and unusual. Um, so here's uh, an example from the literature. This is one of the most highly cited papers in all of signal processing. 
This is uh, uh, John Allen and David Berkeley's uh, celebrated image source method in room acoustics. And I literally stole the picture from their paper. Like this is the this is my blown up version of their picture that explains the method. Right? You just check time. I have 12 minutes. Okay, okay. Well, good. Um, right, so the method, the method says we have a listener here and we have a source here. And if I want to uh, model a filter from other reflections, the straightforward way is to do the red right path. I do a first reflection, I do a uh, second reflection, and so forth, I compute other reflections. And Alan Berkeley observed if I do the mirror reflection virtually of the source and I create an, an image, that actually the path from that thing is just a straight path that's equivalent. Right? So if I take this reflected camera straight line down there, it's actually the same thing as going up here, it's actually going to bounce exactly what this guy did here. And it goes there. It's just an equal angle rule that makes this true. Uh, and so they proposed this to uh, compute IIR filter coefficients because all we need to know where our impulses are is the length for the delay, and we can add from decay based the distance. And that's that's the method. Right. Now, part of why I'm giving this tutorial is because I want you guys to look at it and say, "Oh my God, this is just a chorus." Right. Not a sphere, it's a torus, okay? <laughs> uh, so, observe that when I draw a red rectangle like this, this whole plane is a tiling of the same pattern of axis. Right? This pattern of axis is the same as the one in here. Right? So, and we've already seen that the flat torus is just a tiling of the plane with repeated patterns. Um, everywhere. Right? So this red thing we should call the fundamental domain of the torus, and this picture that Alan Berkeley drew here is the universal cover of the torus. Right? And now it turns out that like, it doesn't have to be this rectangle, it could be this rectangle, this rectangle, this rectangle. Uh, it's just which way you fold first, right? It's like in this construction. You could pick any of those things to be your actual room, and which corner did you paint your original room in is, is a choice. But there's nothing remarkable that you can pick any of these, you can just pick one. And uh, it's the same course, just sort of uh, uh, things painted on a different side of your right hand. Okay, so let's just uh, pick this one, and we now see this infinite timing. Um, and What's, so this is a folded, this is a folded torus. Right. Why is this a folded torus? Well, again, we have an actual internal structure here. We have an extra reflection here, and we have an extra reflection here. So the the thing I did with my origami torus here is exactly what's happening with room reflections. Now. Um, I don't know if I should do this, not that much time. You can draw axes on these corners, and as you fold it up, these axes will align. But they actually fit the same point on your domain um, on this folded torus. Okay, so this is just a depiction. So we have an arrow going through our room, and it reflects, but you can see if you just flip this around this arrow, it will just be linear here. And we can do this from here to here, here to here. The, the collineation is just a flipping around of this domain. Uh, this, these kind of ideas have been used to model membranes uh, by Kala Rubinov, and they argue like it's just more convenient to think of these as states of arrows, right? You have a, a direction where all go to the upper left, a direction where all go to the upper right, lower left, lower right, and they will capture the bounces of all these configurations rather than doing individual constructions. And now we get again what we already sort of did, right? But now we actually also paint our reflection paths on that surface, right? So as we first form a cylinder, we actually see that these uh, straight paths, they do stay continuous, but they become sort of windings along that cylinder. And um, as I form my torus, they actually form, form windings on the torus. And this is a folded torus, that's why we keep track of two reflections, up and down. And we have these windings, 
And if they are, uh, you know, an integer fraction, they actually are closed bindings. Um, and if they're not integer fractions, if they are some rational, an irrational, I should say, number, then they will fill the whole surface of the torus dimension. Okay, um, I do have one more topic that I hope to get in. So, um, is there any more questions about torus? Yes. If I do the image source method in 3D, if I do the image source method in 3D, am I actually on a torus in 4D? Yes. Nice. You are in a one higher dimensional torus. Each identification gives you another torus. It's just like, I, to be honest, I actually can't really visualize a, a three torus in four dimensions. I'm not smart enough for that. And so all my examples are, if I can, on a flat surface, and like this, sometimes I make exceptions for two and a half dimensions. Because like this is my intelligent level, right? this is all I can. <laughs> but yeah, you can prove that that's what you ask is the right answer to uh, the Torah. Uh, okay. Uh, given that we're done with Torah, oh one more thing. Like so the Kelly Rubinoff does this for circular membranes, and it turns out that you can actually show as long as if you have two independent dimensions completely described to shape, it's torus. Right? So a circular membrane, oops, a circular membrane is also a torus, and you can see how these two dimensions stay independent. It's just what here is a x and y type dimension, it becomes a radius and circumference dimension. Circle and ellipse are two prominent examples that for the underlying path dynamics is toroidal. Okay, I always want to build an elliptical drum head, but I never gotten around to it, and part of the reason is because of this. Okay. Uh, so let's switch gears. So we've done all these constructions of circles and toruses, and they're important. But we want to be able to do general topological spaces computation. We want to construct them. And so I'm going to use the last five minutes to give a really rapid introduction into this. And in the second half, we're going to use them. So this is sort of the foundation for what we're going to do in the second half. And most of you probably know this quite well, right? So we have no graphs. Graphs are just a collection of edges and vertices. Where just these are line edges and points. And we can write them in a set notation. We have uh, the graph with edges and vertices, and we have a set of vertices, and a set of, vertices, and a set of edges. Um, very often it's customary to actually recognize that if you have an edge, it connects to vertices, which is not really given in this notation, but it's 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 a typical use, I would say. Uh, there are notions like hypograph that break this, but don't do hypergraphs. Maybe we can have an argument about that. Uh, there are ways to make it more mathematical by just representing these graphs as matrices. Like an adjacency matrix just writes a one into the matrix when uh, two vertices are connected. Right? So in this example, vertex two and vertex one is connected, so there's a one here. So the edges in this picture are implied, and it's going to be a diagonal matrix because there's symmetry. If you had the orientation, you would get minuses here, and it would just be a skew symmetric matrix. Uh, another way of uh, describing uh, a graph in a matrix is, for example, an incident matrix. Uh, here you have a relation of edges to vertices, and we say well, if, an, if an edge is incident on a vertex, then there is a one. Right, so the edge is connected to that vertex here, so it's incident to that vertex. So we have a one here, and we do this construction like this. I, my sort of very subjective perception is that this is the one that is most used, uh, and this is the one that you should most use. Uh, and we'll actually get to an understanding why that is a good argument in the second half. Uh, the way of Arguing why we should construct that matrix is getting in the way of understanding what that matrix actually does. And in the second half, we'll understand this matrix better, which is very cool and which can give you immediate access to many people have on the uh, Now, in our three minutes, let's quickly do absolute simplicities. Like, this is just a quick generalization of, of graph theory. Right? So rather than just having points and lines, now we're also going to allow ourselves higher dimensional things like areas volumes, hypervolumes, you go up in dimension, and so forth. And they're going to be described by always one more entity, right? So 
that we have one point, we have two points described in a line, we have three points described in a triangular-like thing in this area. And if I added another point here, I could do a tetrahedron that is a, a combinatorial model of a body, right? And you just keep going. And the rule for synthesis is that uh, we always imply that its boundaries and lower dimensional objects are included. Right? So if you have a triangle here in DC, we also have these edges that surround it, A, B, B, C, C, A, and we also have these points. So now, computation, you all can implement this. This is just sets. You can just do a memory arrays, no problem. And, but it's also quite memory efficient given this rule because all we need to store is the top element because all these other ones are implied. And in fact, there's a very simple rule that tells us how we get from the top element to a lower dimension one. And so we have our set here uh, of three vertices. And if I delete vertex two from that set, the following thing happens, right? The vertex two is deleted, and the set that we're left with is this set, which is exactly the edge opposite the thing that we deleted. And it turns out that this rule holds in all dimensions. So even if we can't imagine our high-dimensional volumes, we know how we can go down in dimensions. We always get the opposite entity from deleting one thing. And that actually allows us to construct this shape. And just in sequence, delete each one, and we can recover all the edges from that deletion operation. Again, super computational. Right? You all know how to delete something from a list. Right? So this is easy. You can do this. OK, this gives us two maps groups. Okay, this slide got more covered. That's supposed to be uh, the operation of deleting something, get goes from higher dimension to lower dimension. We call this a phase map. Uh, you can just do the inverse. Like you imagine you, you, you know you have a higher dimensional object, you insert the missing one, and that gets you in the other dimension. Right? And these just have the name phase map and code phase map. Uh, and maybe it's good that this slide is double because I'm basically out of time. Just the last thing I'm going to say is a simplicial complex is a construction out of these things with the only rule being that they have to be connected by some shared simplex. It can be a zero simplex, a point, or it can be uh, an edge or something high dimensional. But that's it. Okay. Uh, you're off the hook. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. There's going to be more of this happening in the afternoon.